So um, I was asked to come here um, this morning and kind of give almost like a, an update or a report overview of what myself and Bill and others um, saw when we went to Denmark in August of 2008. We had the opportunity to spend um, five to six days in Denmark and we had the opportunity of um, visiting a numerous amount of farms with an emphasis um, at looking at a gestation uh, cell system that is one opportunity for, for housing uh, gestation cells in a loose setting um, which is termed the free access um, store or free access system. So I'm going to give a little overview of what Denmark and who Denmark is, what, how they're made up, um, uh, linking that uh, more so back to, to pork production, which is obviously where we have an interest, objectives of the trip and who went, um, some of the EU and Danish legislation. I'm not really going to go into huge amounts of detail on that, but at least um, cherry pick out some of the important components of the legislation that the Danish producers are funneling over and utilizing in the gestation systems. Um, we will uh, very quickly touch on some breeding ideas for the cell, but predominantly face uh, or focus on gestating systems with the free access, and then give you some of my takeaway notes that I feel that myself and the group um, picked up when we were actually leaving. Um, we had an, uh, an enormously, I think, successful trip. We were very, very welcomed uh, to Denmark, and it was um, a lot of fun to actually sit down and, and talk one-on-one -on -one with producers who are actually having to run these systems on a day-to-day -day basis and um, talking with producers and talking with then their veterinarians and talking with extension personnel, you've got different components and different uh, opinions of how this system um, is or was not working for them. One little caveat is that I will be showing dimensions. I will be showing measurements pertaining to the size of these components of these feeding stalls and I'll be showing you some dimensions on alley widths that uh, the Danish um, are utilizing because it's part of their law and legislation. But just keep in mind that they may not be the dimensions that we would use in the United States. But I'm going to show you what the Danish are subscribing to over there. So first of all I'd like to just introduce the, the group that went and it was a, it was a diverse group for a number of um, very good reasons. So we had um, John, who was um, at that time IP IPPA's um, president-elect, um, and uh, John, and then of course most of you know Bill, he's just introduced myself this morning. Um, Colin uh, Johnson is a ISU swine extension specialist um, and actually spent a year working in Denmark on um, uh, pork farms and so his uh, expertise, relationships and knowledge of the country was extremely helpful when piecing together this trip. Um, my good friend Tim um, who is a port board, was at the time the port board vice president, um, Sherry Niekamp um, who's uh, currently the swine director at the port board and of course Jean who's the um, uh, IPPA, uh, past IPPA president and currently our chair for the Animal Health and Welfare Committee here in Iowa. And behind the camera was, was Jeff. So firstly, a little welcome to Denmark. And I, me, myself, even coming from the European Union, I, I learned a lot about the Danish people and, and Denmark in general myself. So this was really a, a very good learning experience for me as well. But it's made up of three um, uh, separate little islands, and they're all interconnected by, um, by bridges. Um, or you can, of course, go across by ferry. Um, and we arrived obviously in Copenhagen, which is the, 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 main, the main island here, um, and it's called Zealand. I ch double checked that with Colin on my pronunciation last night. And then Fune, and um, this one is uh, Jutland. And a lot of the um, farms that we visited and agriculture in itself is over on this larger island. Um, it is a country of just over 5 million um, individuals. Um, it cultivates um, around 62% of its land area. Predominant crops there are wheat, barley, and rape. And they are a huge exporter um, in general. Huge exporter of pig-related commodities and also some other entities as well, which I've got a couple of pie charts, and I'll pass all those out for you here in a moment. 
Um, as uh, has been occurring here in the U.S., um, their farm numbers have been decreasing. So in 1970, they estimated that they had around 140,000 um, farms, and that is now down to around 46,000. But conversely, the farm size has been increasing, which again is a pattern that we've seen here in North America. But the acreages on an average farm are much smaller than uh, the United States. Full-time employees um, involved in primary farming, around 67,000 um, individuals from Denmark are employed in that, and full-time employees in the food industry is around 52,000. Some of the characteristics of the uh, Danish uh, producer is that they will own and operate their own farms. Um, there is a compulsory training and educational scheme which relates and translates into a diploma that they need to um, go through. Um, they have very strong farmer organizations over there, and they are very, very actively involved in those organizations. They own the organization and they manage the advisory services, so they're getting the most up-to-date, pertinent information all the time. They, of course, pay. Um, for these um, advisory services, and they work a lot within a co-op co um, uh, scheme. Production costs, um, and this is in euros per kilogram of carcass produced, and we have several different countries running along the bottom. Obviously, the U.S. for us is of interest. For me, uh, the U.K. obviously always funnels in of interest, and of course, uh, Denmark, which we're talking about more so today, and I did get to give you some conversions along the bottom, euros and Danish krone and, and the U.S. dollar, just to give you some, um, some feel for what that would be uh, in, the, in the U.S. system. And so Denmark is um, fifth on the, this list. Uh, the U.S. ranks here uh, being more efficient at three, and unfortunately my um, country is a, a very poor distant 14th or 15th. Pig production, um, the number of pigs actually produced on an annual basis, and this is in um, millions, has also been increasing um, over the last um, 30 or so years. In 1975, the number of pigs produced was just shy of 10 million, and this has stair stepped up to around 25 million um, pigs produced on an annual basis. As I noted, Denmark is a huge exporter, um, and 32% uh, of exports, ag exports, can be related to both fresh and frozen um, pig meats. Uh, cheeses are around 12, um, processed meats is 9, beef and veal 3, and um, poultry meat around 2. An interesting slice that I really began noting as we were over there talking about swine welfare was the 7% uh, of the exports connected to the fur industry, uh, the fur trade within Denmark. And uh, we did get to actually visit a mink farm on our trip. It was our last day. So we did pigs, 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 and then we actually did get to see mink because we were all very interested in that uh, side of farming and, and, and the fur trade um, as we know, has been enormously targeted by a lot of activist groups um, in regards to the way the animals are kept and, of course, for the product itself. And where do they uh, send most of their um, exports to? Well, as uh, we, we would expect, most of it stays within the European Union, with Germany and the United Kingdom taking up a fair slice of that pie chart. Um, Sweden is uh, slightly less at eight and the United States is over here um, at around 3% of that slice. And the Danish pig meat exports by value, uh, just to give you an idea of the money that they make, here is the United States, uh, just over 100 million euro, um, the UK around 800 million euro, and Germany just under 800 million euro. So just to give you a flavor of the amount of money that they do receive for their exportation of pig meat. And also like uh, what the, we've seen in the U.S. with a decreasing number of production sites but an increase in land, um, they are also seeing a shift and an increase in their herd size for their sows. Um, this little green 
is um, herds which have 500 or more cells. And that has been stair-stepping up. And in 2004, it was just over 10%. But again, in relation to some of the farm sites we use here in the United States, that is still a very, very small uh, inventory of cells. I had to break up my presentation. It was too big. So please bear with me while I just uh, get to my second size set. So moving on to some of the, um, the programs and the legislation and um, the compliance that um, Danish um, pork producers need to be um, aware of and subscribe to. And so like um, England, which I was very, very familiar with, or Britain in general, um, Den Den Denmark and Danish producers have many different sources that they have to kind of keep their eye on, keep fresh on, and then implement back onto their farm. There obviously is some European and Danish legislation, which I will delve into in a little bit more here on, some, um, um, on the next few slides. But there are some voluntary industry initiatives, um, which were created by the, the Danish Crown. And there are three components to those um, initiatives. The first one focuses on food safety. The second one focuses on meat quality. And the latter one, which we were obviously interested in, fell under the umbrella of ethics and welfare. And in particular, these various measures, tail bites, hernias, shoulder bruising, neck scarring, and bites to, to the vulva, were recorded by plant personnel. These, uh, this data is then reported back to the producer of interest. And if those um, um, uh, scoring systems are out of compliance, then uh, the farm, the producer, and the advisors need to sit down and come up with a farm-specific action plan to rectify those um, <laughs> items. Another um, piece of, or another program here is the Danish Quality Guarantee, which was released in 1995. It's a very thorough documentation of standard practices in Denmark, and in, there are some additional items and issues which are funneled into that, which pertain to the level of lighting that the sows need to be exposed to, uh, noise levels, for example, and there's some other items in there as well. And of course, there are some niche market demands as well. In particular, in Denmark, producers can sell through an organic market. They can sell to free range markets. And there are some producers who have tailor made their systems to be able to sell um, pigs to, uh, to the United Kingdom markets. So taking apart the EU regulations, um, there are three uh, predominant directives, which I've listed here, um, which pertain back to, um, to the pig specifically. Um, and these directives are, direct, are, are towards the farm only. There are many other directives out there which uh, focus more so on the transportation um, part of, of the farm and, of course, the other species as well. So some of the big ones, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, this top one here is that the no gestation stalls, our traditional stalls, um, will not be allowed to be used within the European Union as of the 1st of January 2013. So producers are having to think about, if they haven't already, um, other options that they can then place their gestation sow in. There are also um, legislation requirements on floor space for each animal, always making sure that there's an alarm system back up for the ventilation of the system and that you are not allowed to wean at a minimum of four weeks. And there are some caveats attached to this. So if the health of the sow and all of the piglets are considered to be at risk by the veterinarian, then you are allowed to wean uh, and keep documentation at a younger age. But most of the farmers have to subscribe to an average of four weeks. On top of that, the Danish regulations, they have a Danish Animal Welfare Act, which was passed in 1991. And a tail spin off of that is that they did establish the Danish Council of Animal Ethics, who have oversight of the welfare legislation and policies that producers subscribe to. Focusing back onto the, um, the pig industry and the pig side, um, they have ruled out that no sows in gestation are allowed to be neck or belly tethered as of 2005. Um, cooling facilities or cooling systems or capabilities need to now be in uh, new facilities as they have been built from 2000 and certainly within all systems by 2015. In the year 2000, for new construction, they had to have a minimum of one-third solid flooring. 
for group housing of pregnant sows as of week four post-service until day seven pre faro They need to be in a loose housing system. If the manure system can accommodate uh, this next bullet point, nesting material um, is given to sows one week or so before predicted farrowing date. There are also some um, uh, uh, detailed uh, direction on um, not tooth clipping um, piglets and special requirements for tail docking. And there's also a caveat in there on making sure that sows have access to some form of a material. It can be straw, it could be peat, um, but they do not class chains, dangling chains or uh, rubber tubes or balls in a pen as considered to be uh, to meet the needs of having availability to material. So uh, this is um, the space allowances, and of course all the space allowances in the EU are provided in the metric system, so for the audience today I've also provided the equivalent of feet square as well. And um, any, uh, these slides will be available for, for people, so um, you're, you're most welcome to, to grab these slides um, after today's seminar. Um, but you can see here that they devy this down into an area location, a lying area location, and then they also divvy this down further into the number of cells that are actually within a group. So if you have one to four cells in a group, it's about 30 square foot per cell. And if you have 40 or more in a group, it goes down to around 22 square foot per cell. And gilts are treated in a separate category, 1 to 10 gilts around 20 feet, and greater than 10 gilts 18 feet respectively. I did note about the rooting materials for play, but also to give satiety for feeding. Um, rooting material as of January 1st, 2013, and as of May 15th, 2003, it needed to be given to provide some form of aseity to the sow as well. So as you can see, there's a lot of different components that producers need to be aware of, and a lot of different factoring in dates that you also need to be aware of as well. So the key is legislation and law, okay, but are we going to be able to monitor and also document and control what is going on on the farm. It's very well to sit there and write pages and pages of law and legislation, but is it going to be translated out into the industry? And so their monitoring and control is actually done by the Danish Veterinary Service. And 5% um, of, the, of, the, of the herds, of the pig herds, are actually audited annually um, by vets. 50% of that 5% are audited randomly, so it's just kind of a, a name out of a hat concept. And then the remainder of the um, pool that fit into that 5% of herds which are audited annually come from farms which have been red flagged as having potential challenges or issues connected to welfare. So some of those issues have been identified when I was doing my reading as um, antibiotic use, too much antibiotic use, and perhaps um, poor quality pigs. Remember we talked about hernias and scratches and bites to the vulva at the plant. Some of those records may be out of compliance, which would then red flag that farm perhaps to be in this pool for auditing. A very interesting thing talking to the veterinarians over there, it is mandated and tra that they mandate and they track all their farms and that veterinarians out there need to make at least 12 visits a year to that farm. And they need to be out there at least every 35 days. Okay? Um, every medication that the veterinarian prescribes is documented and tracked. So what it is, how many pigs were receiving it, and, and the dosage as well is all documented. Um, the uh, producer then takes this uh, script to a licensed pharmacy to fill that script and they are able to produce monthly and annual and yearly reports on the usage per vet and tie that back to, to the producer. And the farmer has to maintain or retain these medication usage records for a period of three years. 
So let's think a little bit now about the housing systems for the sow. And this is my one slide which is really talking about the breeding because I said we were very interested in the gestation uh, period. But I did want to throw this in just to give you the, the concepts. In, in Denmark, you are still able to place the, um, the, the sow at the time of weaning into an individual breeding store, which we are very familiar with here in the United States. And as I said, at four weeks, they then need to be moved out into the loose house gestation uh, environment, whatever that producer is subscribed to. And there's some, um, obviously some benefits to that. There's increased safety. Um, the producer has excellent overview of each individual sow and is able to um, pertain to each of her individual needs. And of course, it's a very competitive price. However, as I noted, one of the markets you know, within Denmark is the UK pig market. And their program has subscribed that the sows, even in the um, service section or the breeding area um, are not allowed to be placed in these individual stalls. And so this is just a, a snippet here of what a producer may utilize if they were selling product to the UK market. Uh, these uh, next few slides are courtesy of the Danish pig production um, uh, company that we actually did visit with in Copenhagen. And uh, it is noting here the number of sows in a 24-hour period, 0 to 20, and the days after weaning, day of weaning all the way through to day 10, and the number of confrontations which would be considered to be flank biting, some sort of biting and a challenge and interaction that would be considered to be aggressive on one sow's part to another. And we can see on the day that they're first mixed, um, there is almost 20 sows in a 24-hour period that have these confrontations, but that it does tend to stair step down and then begin to plateau off. So it's, it's saying there that the sows will shuffle around and then they will establish that grouping. There is also some changes within their activity during heat. Uh, the green bar is the numbers of mounting that a sows will engage in. The orange bar is the flank nosing, and the gray silver bar is the, the bore contact. And uh, the zero, day zero, is considered to be the day of standing heat. The sow is ex it's actually standing for, for being bred four days prior to with four days afterwards. And we can start to see, as we get closer to standing heat, that the sows will engage in more mounting. There is certainly much more interest towards the bore, and there's also um, an increase in flank uh, nosing, which then stair steps off. Um, to, to four days afterwards where we really don't see too much of those behaviors in the sow. They've also looked at the activity according to where the sows would rank, whether they would be a higher ranking animal, a middle ranking animal, or a low ranking animal, again for nosing, for flank nosing, and for mounting. And the number of sows over a day period, over 24 hours, which would be engaged in those behaviors. And what we see here is that the high-ranking sows engage in an awful lot of nosing and quite a large amount of mounting in relation to the medium-ranked sows and also in relation to the lower-ranked sows. And here is very interesting. Flank nosing is much larger in the medium rank and mounting is pretty non-existent for those low-ranking sows, which means it's saying that those higher-ranked sows are the ones jumping on top of more of a low-ranking sow. So we were very interested in the free access feeding stalls and um, I'm going to show you um, several different um, systems that we actually got to see in Denmark and there's some little twists and differences on the floor design and whether they used deep bedded substrate or not, which I think you're going to really enjoy here. So group housing gestating cells have been obviously increasing because the law and legislation is driving it that way. So from the year 2000 it was around 30% and by 2010, they predict um, almost 90% of their sow, gestation sow herds are going to be in the loose housing system. So what is the free access feeding stall, and what are some of the positives that are listed for this, for this given system? Um, producers, veterinarians, and uh, extension personnel over there noted that it does allow um, the sows to all eat at the same time. There is um, one feeding stall for every sow within that group, okay? And it also still allows you as a producer to be able to top up and um, give some one-on-one uh, -on -one attention to those individual sows as well. However, it does require a larger area than our traditional gestation stall. And I do have a little video link that I'd like to try and 
play for you today. Um, let's see. So it's just kind of giving you um, a feel. This is actually what would consider to be a T system, which I'll introduce here in a moment. We have the slatted flooring right here. I call this the pig's eye view, than the bird's eye view. We have our feeding uh, uh, structures right here. Nipple waterers often would come down into these individual stalls so they were able to eat and drink. And we have the gates here, which I'm going to show you um, in more detail in a moment, that act almost like a seesaw. So the sow can go in and press a bar or a lever, and then the back would come down, and she would be able to lock herself in. And then she also had the power to be able to then back out and unlock that gate, which would then prevent other sows from uh, being able to come in while she was in that stall, and consider she could be considered to be in a more vulnerable position. See, this one can't get in. So she can't get in and start to chew up the vulva or the tail of that sow. So one feeding stall what per sow. This uh, example here has no substrate and it just has the rectangle um, alley uh, behind these uh, stalls that the sows can then come in and out of. Again, we have um, our, uh, this would be uh, solid and right here would be um, a slatted flooring where the manure would be able to fall through. So that's one system design for this free access stall. Um, comments that came back that some people were not, didn't like so much about this system was that they felt that there was really no natural and defined lying area outside the stall. Um, there was extensive dunging behavior really in the entire area. They really didn't get their dunging pattern figured out. Um, these lying walls, um, producers said, did not really significantly affect or improve the sow behaviors. They, they may use them, they may not. And it was very difficult if they did use uh, bedding or any root rooting material back here to keep it dry because, frankly, the sows were urinating and defecating randomly within that system. This, again, um, is just the rectangle behind. Um, and we have a little more poured concrete back here. Again, it's um, got the slatted flooring. Um, but we also have in here more of a deep, um, a deep litter. This, would, this was chopped straw that the sows could could utilize. Getting a, more of a view, um, there were, were a couple of designs that we saw for the sow being able to lock herself down. This one, she would actually press this panel with her nose and the gate would then swing shut behind her. We have the feed components here with a nipple water again which would come down and the feed would drop into ground troughs that the sow would then be able to consume her food. And this was the other style we predominantly saw, which is what I, for the likes of a better uh, terminology, I call it the seesaw. So she would go in, she would lift this lower panel up, and as she lifted that panel up, the back conversely would, would come down onto her. And I also have some more video to demonstrate that as well. It's always better just to let the sows show you, I think. So you can see she moved in, and she moved that down, but she didn't lock in. It buzzed back up again. You had that kind of seesaw effect. These ladies here have actually locked themselves in because the back is much more flush um, at the base of that, of that sow. This one's now coming out. And so they can buzz back and forward and go in and out of these different ones which are open and, and don't have a sow in it. And sometimes they lock themselves in and sometimes they don't. <clears throat> Some other things that the group were paying attention to, um, apart from the different styles of the stall that can, are available for a producer, but also looking at the flooring as well. And so here um, they had built out a little bit more concrete at the back um, again, it was um, 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 slat, uh, slatted flooring so that manure could fall through. 
And then in the center part, this is kind of now a bigger picture up here. You can see it, um, it um, stair steps down a little bit. It's got a, um, an incline. And then um, there, this is uh, the straw right here in this rectangle um, conformation again. Um, produ the producer, when I was talking with that producer, said that his employees liked this extra um, concrete being poured there because they were able to check the cells at the front. There was an alleyway at the front of those stalls so they could check to see who was eating and how the cells looked up front. But then they could also walk behind the cells and also check uh, confirmation of their legs, looking at their feet, looking at their tail and their vulva as well. So from a worker standpoint, um, the, the, the workers particularly liked that one. And then this was in the same facility. Actually, this producer, he had the, um, one, the one I just previously described. And on the other side, he had more of this shorter step down. And so he was just playing around with pouring concrete, not pouring concrete, and figuring out which one um, both the sows and also the workers preferred. One thing that I think impressed the group was um, the cleanliness was the um, amount of light that were in these facilities. You can see that the uh, roof structure is much higher than some of the facilities that we traditionally use here. Lots of concrete were poured, and they used materials that were going to last a long time. Uh, in here, they actually had brick walls that would then um, have gates here, which would then lead into where the cells resided. Here's that alleyway I was uh, talking about. So we have the feed uh, containers right here. The food drops into the, into the trough. The sows come in and begin eating. And then the producer and the workers, caretakers, are able to walk up and down here and check on their sows. In addition, they had these swing gates that they were able to either obviously um, keep open and or close up. So if they did need to move sows in and out, um, it gave them uh, com compartments to be able to, to manage those animals. Another nice feature with these systems is that the sow is not the only one in control of being able to lock herself in. The caretaker or producer is also able to lock in either an individual sow or maybe four to five sows, depending on how they've built these handles. And so they can actually manually pull these handles down and lock sows in if they want to um, do some uh, vaccination, some blood work, or some, something with those individual animals. And right here is another example here of that level, which would then... Um, you would pull down, and it would just then be able to lock that one system. Another design here is the, um, the T, the T pen. It has a little bit of a substrate right here. Um, you have the, uh, the stalls that we've already talked about a little bit this morning. The animals can obviously stay in here. They can maneuver out, and then they can maneuver up to here and either lay on this side or lay on this side as well. What they liked about this is that they felt there was more of a separation for the lying and dunging areas. Um, they were much more well defined, and therefore, if they were using substrate, um, uh, sorry, yes, if they were using substrate, then not all the bedding was wet and mushy from urine and feces. They did note that 50 to 70 percent of the sows would use the lying area during resting times. And this is just giving you a little bit of uh, comparison. For the Danish crone, it was $10,000 per per feeding store per space for sale, which then uh, equates to about $1,700 here. And the ESF system, which I'm not talking about today, but we do have information on that from a previous trip, um, is a little cheaper at 7,000 crones. Again, a T system, but limited substrate use, just to give you a feel for that one. This is just to prevent the sow from rising up out of the stall. This is more in the uh, lying area. As you can see, they don't always deep bed these systems. And then this other design is considered to be an L. So the T is this way, and then the L is this way, but the same kind of uh, concept. They do have some um, uh, recommendations here um, for the um, back of the stall to the back of the stall. They cannot have anything less than three meters, which roughly is just over, well, almost 10 foot uh, in here in the US. There are also recommendations for stall dimensions and for uh, measuring those. The length is from the back of the feeding trough nearest to the sow towards the back of the stall. So for the gestation facility with loose housing, the feeding and resting stalls need to be 60 centimeters 
and 210 centimeters in length, or 82 and 23. The behavior of the animal will change um, by components of what uh, is going on in that uh, overall system. What producers were noting is that the, uh, low, the higher the temperature, the warmer it was, they would prefer to lay in their individual stalls. But as the temperature got cooler and cooler, if the, if there was, um, um, and especially if there was substrate out, out in, the, in the loafing area or in that tea area, um, they would then prefer to actually move out of the individual stalls and lay together as a collective group. The sow's use of the feeding store, interestingly, also will change as they progress through gestation. So if they've recently been served and halfway through gestation, they actually like uh, or seem to prefer here to be in the deep litter um, area, but towards the end of gestation, they will choose to lay in the individual store more. And the usage can also change um, a fraction depending on the time of day. Again, this is for the uh, percentage of sows which are found in the deep litter. So more sows are going to be in that deep litter in the evening hours and are found more so in the feeding stalls in the morning and in the afternoon. And this is going to lead on nicely to our next speaker who's going to talk about euthanasia a little bit. But they do also have... Um, the uh, regulations and legislation for sows that do need treatment. They call them relief pens, and obviously we call them here hospital pens. So sows which uh, go down, um, have particular um, injuries and wounds to them, have been involved in a lot of fighting, are flagged, and are then moved to these relief or these hospital pens. And here are some of the legislative requirements which are connected to a hospital pen. No more than three animals in a relief pen, two-thirds soft bedding, they also have minimum um, space allowances, again, for these animals as well. And there was a couple of designs that we actually got to see while we were over there as well. And this was something that intrigued us. We went on to a farm, and none of us really knew what that was, but this is actually where they will put a sow for collection if she is euthanized or if she dies. And so these are usually right as you enter onto the farm property, the sow will be moved down, will be placed underneath. Uh, actually, this is very light, and it's just then um, placed over the top of the sow so that the uh, general public do not see that. And then the um, renderers will go round between farm sites, will lift the, They don't even have to actually get out of their truck because they're able to lift it off using this little circle, place it to one side, pick the sow up, put her in, and then just put that back onto the, to the base. So some general take-home notes from the trip. This is my last slide for you. Most producers will breed, unless they're from the, doing UK markets, in stalls. They'll preg check at four weeks. They'll move them into a form of a loose housing system for the gestation sow. I've shown you the free access system today, but of course they do have ESF and other connotations. Most groups were, uh, kept in, in, were static in nature. They tried to group them also by size. Vets would visit at least, well, have to visit once a month. Um, this is, going, I think, going to be more and more of a big issue in Denmark is the shoulder lesions. Um, and really, in these systems, there's all sorts of floor types and, and level of substrate use and, and, and different numbers of cells which are used in a group. There are some, obviously some legislative areas that the producer has to abide to, but they also have quite a bit of flexibility to play around with the system design as well.